Let me get right to the beginning, to the future of music. And I'm very excited to be here today talking about the future of music and telling you about a little bit what the music creation industry is going to contribute to that. And uh, Native Instruments is actually in the field of providing computer-based solutions to music producers and DJs. And I want to set the stage with some impressions of the exciting industry that we are in. So, talking about the future of music is basically not possible without talking about Germany. Because it's a fact. Think that every second commercial song in the world is created based upon software made in Germany. And you could, for that reason, consider Germany the Silicon Valley of music creation. And digital music making is actually not much different from traditional music making. You need uh, composition, so a tool to put the notes down, to arrange stuff, and you need something that sounds, instruments. And in the digital world, that is music production software on the one hand, and software instruments on the other. And now some stats. Over 50% of all music production software in the world stems from Germany. Companies like Steinberg, Ableton, Bitwig, and Native Instruments, we all build the software that is used in the world. And on the instrument side, it's the same. Over 50% of software instruments stem, stem from Germany and actually from my company, Native Instruments. And it's really musicians of all genres that use these products. Alicia Keys, Carl Cox, Drake, Jean-Michel Jarre, Björk, Hans Zimmer, Depeche Mode, Adele, Metallica, Placebo, Beyonce, or Kendrick Lamar. You name them. They all base their production on German stuff. But it's not only these top artists that utilize the software we build. It's actually aspiring musicians, the next generation of musicians that uses it. And um, so there is a lot more people that are hobbyists and that express themselves musically with that. But what is the big opportunity ahead of us? The Opportunity is about the democratization of music creation. And Alexandra already mentioned it. Music is the most popular art form in the world. Among the most popular people are musicians. Think Mozart, think Michael Jackson. And we actually ran a survey just recently in the Western Hemisphere and asked people if they sing or play, and 20%, 22% of them said, yes, I express myself musically. But an almost 50% said, they do not play yet an instrument, but are interested to do so. So let's get back in time for one sec. 40 years ago, it was really hard to create a song. You had to buy very expensive, bulky gear, and you needed a big room to put it all together. 40 years later, 
one guy has changed it all, called the computer. This guy really made the transition happening. Basically, since the mid-90s, there is music software available to really turn a computer into a very powerful music creation device. And we've come a long way. By now, you can turn your bedroom into a music production studio. So everything is great? It's not, because there is still tons of barriers that you have to deal with when you get into music production. Just think that you need to be very tech-savvy, patient to do it, and you need some money. And let me talk about these barriers more concretely. First of all, you want to express yourself musically, you need sound, you need the tools. Where do I find them? They are actually distributed amongst hundreds and thousands of websites, so it's really hard to even know what you are supposed to use and where to find it. Secondly, music making is complex. Anyone here in the room that may have tried it, it is difficult because there is a lack of a lot of things that I'm going to talk in a minute about that make it actually a demanding experience. And last not least, hey, wait a second, this guy just said that 40 years ago everything was so expensive and now you can turn your bedroom into a studio. Yes, that is true. Back then it was 10 thousands of dollars to equip a studio, now it's a few thousand, but a few thousand is still much too much to empower the many more people that actually want to express themselves musically. So what can we learn from other industries? We took a look and we felt that, one, it requires central services. So just think of what Valve did with the Steam platform, bringing all the games of the world together in one place in a really convenient experience. That changed a ton for the games world. And then let's think back in the 90s when you had your PC and you installed from a dozen different or I don't know how many different providers with very different installation routines, update schedules, etc. It was really messy. By now, we have an app store that handles millions of apps really easily and conveniently to get you going. And last not least, Let's look at Adobe, what they did in their vertical of photo manipulation. They were able to move from perpetual licenses to subscription business, which makes a big difference. They can now reach out to a lot more beginners that weren't able to pay the prices that were up before. So what did Native Instruments take away from this? And how can we actually do something, not just for our company, but how can we help to leverage our whole industry? We believe we've got a couple of solutions in place that can help to really democratize music creation. For one, as a matter of fact, just five days ago, we launched a place called sounds.com. It's supposed to become the world's hub for all the sound and all music tools there is. So in terms of central services, finding the stuff you need, forget about that problem. It won't be one in the near future. Secondly, we've introduced a few years back what we call the native control standard. It's actually a sound standard that allows all the different plugin manufacturers that support it to have the same kind of environment and deal with the same routines all over the place. It's actually adapted by almost all players in our industry by now. And lastly, we've just done starting the transition from perpetual license to subscription, software as a service. It brings down prices and it's more flexible. You can decide when you want it, if you want it, and you can just select the tools that you need at an affordable price. So I could stop right here, because this is all I had to say about the future of the music creation industry. But I don't, because I believe that an even larger opportunity lays in the consolidation of the whole music value chain. So just think, today there is a tremendous gap between music consumption and creation. It's really two different worlds. The only ones that did a step in that direction were SoundCloud. They allow their creators, the people that upload their music and share it with the world, to receive commands, to receive inspiration from the fans and uh, take it that way. But now think that you really connect the artist and the fan in a much more, in a much tighter, integrated fashion. This will allow to 
actually have people learn about what their artists do and contribute to it, collabor collaborate with them. There's tons of possibilities to do so. Just think that you're in Spotify, you make a double click on any track, and you dive into the elements of the song, how it was created, the sounds, the melody. You could probably change it. This is only possible if creation and consumption come together. And at the same time, you're going to create the largest possible funnel of future music creators by accessing the consumer space. So this marriage, this merge of two worlds will be very powerful and it will make something available as well that was talked about before today, uh, which is why not adding blockchain to the max? track all the creative actions and the consumption and really be able to, be, uh, to distribute the wealth that was created by all the contributors to music in an appropriate fashion. So really pay creators fairly and allow so many more to contribute and yeah, cut out the one or other middleman that doesn't really create value. And last not least, we have the chance to change the music experience itself. It may sound a little awkward out there, but we believe that what we experience today, which is linear songs, it's three minutes, 53, and it's just that. Those days will be gone, because what the music will do, it will adapt to our mood, it will adapt to our environment, it will be a flexible thing. Just think movies where the soundtrack evolves with the movie, or games that uh, require for the music to really interact with wh wherever the gamer is going. I call it the soundtrack of your life. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, the future that we foresee. And we try to support that future as much as, much as we can as Native Instruments and follow our vision, which is all about inspire and empower all music lovers to create the future of music. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, in order to deep dive a little bit further into the discussion on the future of music, I would like to welcome the moderator of the session to the stage, Sebastian Kurs. He is the managing partner of EMH here in Munich, one of the youngest investors in Germany, so definitely a talent to watch. And he helped us to put together this session. So I'll now you. let you take the word. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe you guys just join us on stage and we start right off. Grab my glass. Did we decide where? Uh, you stay in the middle. Okay. Right, so let's uh, start right off. Thank you, Daniel, for the great keynote. I think it's, um, it's a topic that basically anybody can connect to and um, First question to the audience, who likes to mu listen to music uh, at home, in the car, at work, wherever you are? Okay, um, who plays an instrument? Who has played instruments before? Okay, quite, uh, quite a lot. And who has ever recorded a song? Uh, not too bad. So you see, um, it's, it's a huge topic, and I think we have a great round of people, a great set of people up on stage. Um, Next to, to me is um, a legend of music creation. Um, he will introduce himself in a second, but just this morning he stopped DJing at quarter to nine in the morning, from five to nine in the morning at a techno club in, in Munich, Blitz. Yeah? So I think this is really worth a, a warm hand of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Daniel, why don't you just introduce yourself very quickly? Yeah, my name is Daniel Miller. I, um, I started Mute Records uh, in 1978 as an independent uh, seven-inch only label at the start, specializing in the new burgeoning electronic music field. I've had the pleasure of working with some really great artists, including Depeche Mode, Moby, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, Gold Frap, Richie Horton, and over the years, many, many others. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a legend, really. 
He's, he's really um, very humble, but he was the guy producing the, the albums of Depeche Mode, and I think uh, this is really a change to the whole music industry. It has been a, a tremendous change for industrial music and electronic music from the UK. So um, thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Marte Garlick. Um, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer and President at Native Instruments. Um, in the 90s, I spent uh, a lot of my time being a DJ and a music producer, touring, playing a lot of the records that Daniel was putting out. Um, and eventually, because of my um, passion for techno music, it really led me towards the companies that were emerging, trying to build new tools in the digital space to help to actually progress the music. So this is how I joined Native Instruments. I'm there by now almost 20 years and have been involved in designing and developing most of our products. And I'm still there um, looking out for new technologies and products to expand our portfolio. So I think he's a legend too. In, in the 90s, he was uh, one of the early childs of the techno movement in Europe. And uh, he was also a TV host mm -hmm. with uh, Heike Makac on Viva. Yeah? So crazy times back then. But I think this is also a, a great combination to see two different generations of, of music legends on stage uh, talking about the future of music, which is, uh, as, we say, as, as we saw from Daniel, uh, a very interactive future. So, Daniel, maybe... Yeah, actually, I can confirm where if we go, someone approaches us and says, hey, I know you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then they bring up uh, either the club or uh, some of his uh, TV experiences. So, my own background is um, I used to work in the advertisement business, ran a graphic and web design design studio um, and actually was glad to be able to follow the whole transition of um, the pre-press industry to desktop publishing uh, in my former career. And that helped me when I joined uh, the Native Instruments founders team to really understand what's ahead of us because the, the good thing is, and we, we may realize that today here too, our industry is still a niche industry and is always late to the game. So it was not very hard to be at the forefront when we started it 21 years ago. Um, and ever since, I run uh, Native Instruments as a CEO. Great. Um, maybe just the first question to you, Daniel, um, as, as the producing artist DJ uh, here on stage. Witnessing more than four decades of, of music creation and uh, running through different stages of the whole industry, how did the computer and technology really change the way music is created? And do you see that more people are in the game now? Well, it's revolutionized the, the making of music, the creation of music. Um, as, as Daniel said earlier, it, it, it allowed people to, to make music on their, literally on their desktops. Uh, in their homes or wherever they wanted to. Um, as, the, as computers became more powerful in the 90s and early 2000s, then the potential of uh, what the instruments could do and the, the, the workstations could do grew very quickly. Mm. And uh, it made it accessible to many millions of people that would not, who otherwise wouldn't have been able to make music and uh, had no opportunity to make music. And I think one of the th things that I like about electronic music in general, and some people might disagree with this, but you don't actually have to have any musical knowledge whatsoever to make the music. You just have to have great ideas and a good ear, but you don't have to have any, any kind of technical knowledge. So that also opened the door for a lot of, a lot of people. Um, of course, there's a downside to it. Yeah. Not, not a downside. There's, you know, there's a, another side to it. There's a, it's quite easy to make quite good music on a computer, something that's nice to listen to. But really what moves people and what really changes people as, as a listener, people's lives, is exceptional music. And exceptional music is just as difficult to do uh, as it's ever been. You know? And it, it, you know, it's, it, the possibilities that we'll find as a label find more exceptional musicians is, is greater because the more people, there's more chance that they'll emerge. But you have to swim through an awful lot of mediocrity. I mean, an awful lot of mediocrity yeah. Yeah. in order to get there. Well, it's, it's a fair point about the, the sheer mass of music uh, yeah. that has been created in the last maybe 10 years or yeah. 15 years. And uh, we see that Spotify has been also moving into the creation space when they were acquiring uh, Soundtrap, a company 
in November last year, which is basically an online web browser-based music studio for beginners. Mm. So when you want to start out making your first song, you yeah, might go to Soundtrap. Marta, what do you think? Um, is, is the creation and the consumption actually converging and moving to the same place uh, as, as Daniel uh, emphasized? I definitely think so. I don't think that Spotify alone is the answer to that, but um, I think they as a company are pretty progressive. Um, they have always been. I think they are now able to take more risks as well because, you know, they are the largest contributor to the rise of the music sales again, so they have the labels behind them. And, um, but they are really working off low margins, so um, they understand that there is really the opportunity that Daniel was referring to, uh, that there is the biggest funnel of new creators out there, and obviously having the tools, owning the tools that people are using to create um, is uh, very much helpful. Um, on a more general level, I would say every musician today has started as a music lover or as a fan at some point. And so, you know, there is already this connection between them. I think just they are quite disconnected uh, in a lot of ways today. And I think finding ways how to create this connection in a more seamless or a more diverse way, there is really a lot to gain. And Spotify have really understood that. Yeah, I guess everybody who is a Spotify client has been through this uh, process of tr trying to get new music, and uh, as you say, it's uh, it's just uh, yeah very hard to find in this sheer mass of of um, mediocrity um, to actually find the exceptional music. Um, thinking about different industries, Daniel, that that uh, have been through this kind of same transformation, um, do you see any? Com comparison between the music industry and other industries who have been transformed by technology, moving from a very elite product, very niche um, consumer base or prosumer base to a wide consumer market? Yeah, as I said earlier, um, as an example, Adobe really made this transition from being a high-priced elite product, making it available to so many more to manipulate their pictures and create better results with their, with their visual stuff. Um, so they are a great example. They really did this transition very successfully. That said, the music industry is quite a bit more complex than, let's say, uh, <coughs> manipulating pictures. Mm. Uh, you need more components to come together to allow you to really make it happen. And that's why I also uh, um, was talking about the different things that have to come together to really make a difference. And it's not just the transitioning to a subscription. That alone will not do it, but if you combine it with central services, with certain industry standards, you can really make a huge difference and reach out to many more. And obviously, you know, uh, in the consumer space, if you look at Netflix and others, this, this is the future. Uh, at least we do believe that this is the future. And uh, it's exciting to, to be able to contribute to it. Mm. Um, you know, um, Alex said that I'm actually one of the younger guys here in this room, but uh, I still grew up with CDs and, and vinyl. So uh, record labels have been playing a pretty dominant role in the, in the whole um, music creation value chain. So how do you think will, will the labels uh, see their future in this very uh, yeah, sh reshaping industry, which is now converging from the creation and the consumption um, and maybe cutting out middlemen like you said before so well as a middleman or a middle person <laughs> um, you know when I started I I did put out my own record on my own label so and I did it and I recorded it in my bedroom mm. and I think that was the first wave of the democratization of, of making music and distributing it was very independent completely outside the industry and Whenever an artist come, came to me to want to be on my label, I always, the first thing I said to them, why don't you do, my first question is always, why don't you do it yourself? Okay, because it's possible to do it yourself. Mm. Um, and, they, they, and for some people they went off and they did it themselves. But other people like that creative collaboration with, and it, it's not, you know, making music is a, is, is, is very different, uh, a very different process for different kinds of musicians. Some people can sit on their own in their, in their bedroom or wherever, on the computer. They can put it up on SoundCloud. They can go to an aggregator and it can be online all over the world and they can get paid for it. 
and they can do social media to promote it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and they're happy with that. Mm. But other artists really want don't, they all they want to do is make music. And so for some artists, I mean, the, the, the term record label seems very kind of anachronistic today, even though we still make physical records. But I think what I, you know, we're not called Mute Records anymore, we're called Mute Artists. And we're very much an artist folk, we've always been a very artist focused label. And for the, the right artist in the right label, the right group of people, call it what you want, that can be a very constructive thing and it works for many, for many artists. And I think we'll continue to do so. And I think, you know, on the other side, well, uh, people putting out their own music and distributing it themselves will, mm. will grow as well. I think they can, all these things can live in the same universe. You know, I don't think it's just for certain artists, those kind of services are really important. So do we still need artists in the future? Talking about artificial intelligence, uh, why don't you just... I could just turn on my computer, click some buttons, and get a music track out of that. So will there be somehow a human necessity of, of interaction, or can we just rely on the computer in the future, creating the new hits that we hear on the radio? Um, may, may I say that um, we're confronted with this discussion since, since, the st since we started Native Instruments. Uh, people were thinking just because we turned the computer into musical instruments and sound machines, we would put musicians out of uh, their jobs. The contrary is the case, as we just learned, millions and millions more people now express themselves musically. Um, and in the end, we have a strong belief that we just need to help the musicians to express themselves. And AI is a very powerful tool that can exactly support that process. Let me give you a non-AI but very simple example from the DJ world. Actually, you used it uh, uh, last night. I don't know if you use the sync button. I think you do. Sorry. You have to. The sync button in Tractor. Of course. You know, <laughs> I mean... Uh, I'm not into this syncing up records business. If you, if you recall, I'm more DJ yeah. has to beat match two records. You know, yeah, that's yeah. traditionally how it's done. And in Tractor, our DJ software, you just click one button and it's matched. And people go like, wow, you put my, me out of place. I have no job anymore. I mean, you, you really destroy DJ. I mean, I, But the reality is, yeah. you just focus on other stuff yeah. and not on beat matching. And yeah, I think this exactly. kind of advancing music by allowing people to add different elements on top Mm. and taking care of others that may be simpler to be done by a machine, that is uh, uh, where I think things are going. And it's not a replacement of the artist, but an enhancement, a support to express themselves in a different fashion. Yeah, Or I'm, may I wrong with that? I mean, I remember when, you know, as I said, I started with electronic music, and at that time, the Musicians' Union in, in, in the UK banned their members from using synthesizers because they thought it was, <coughs> would put people out of work. Actually, it created a lot more work for musicians because yeah. there were a lot more musicians. Yeah. And so, uh, so, you know, so I mean... Uh, 80s. I, I mean, I don't know, you know, of course it's going to be, po it already is possible to, yeah. to, 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 to make music just by tapping in a few parameters and then let the computer do it. But I think, you know, I, I think there will, there will uh, I, I never say always in this world, but for the foreseeable future, humans will still be making music alongside computers, I think, I think and with computers. I think it's also because the perception of what is original is changing. I believe that actually automation and, you know, certain things that become easier are actually driving creativity with uh, new creators to actually do stuff differently. You know, I think that is really mm. progressing music. And so, uh, on the one side, there's a lot of people that may find it easier to get into music making. And on the other side, there's people that are thinking about, hey, that has become so easy, how can I actually take it to the next level? Yeah. And I think that these two dimensions are actually helping each other and they are not contradicting with each other. So we try to not be as nerdy as, as, uh, as it can get um, at this panel, but I think for the audience it would be very interesting to understand, maybe as a last question um, from the panel here, and then we can go to the Q&A. Um, it would be very interesting to understand How will my life as a non-musician be affected by what you guys have been talk about, talking about? And, and how will the, the user experience change um, in the future so that maybe my kids or I uh, or whoever can express themselves musically, uh, which is a human need, as you, as you showed in, the, in your keynote? What do you think? How will it really change your life 
and uh, the life of everybody. Well, if, you want, if you're a non-musician who wants to be part of the creative process, that's already very po I mean, that's possible. As I said earlier, you don't have to be a musician to make great music. You just, yeah. These days, you just have to have really great ideas. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that would, oh, that potential will only increase as time goes on and the, the, the ease of use and will, uh, will, that will only continue, that will only continue to grow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Daniel has already pointed out our vision around how the uh, nature of music will actually change in the future. But it's not going to happen from one day to another. It's mm. going to be a gradual process. You know, Daniel already mentioned there's too much music out there. I think the issues that people are solving, to, trying to solve today is how am I finding the music that really matters to me? And so this is what a lot of research has been put into. I think the next level is actually how can this process of the listening experience become a little bit more interactive. So I believe that elements from DJing uh, that people associate with DJing will actually become a more part part of the uh, listening experience. And I think, you know, with years, uh, it's going to gradually become more interactive. You know, I can basically take some music, connect it with some visuals very freely, share it with you and kind of express myself with this. It's not really creating music, but it's actually recontextualizing music in an interesting way. And I think eventually, with technology moving forward, it will become more and more the soundtrack of your life and adapt towards you as everything else is adapting around you as well. And yeah. this is really going to be uh, um, like a linear, not linear <laughs> process, but something which is more gradual. Okay. I mean, just to, the DJ aspect of it, I mean, it seems like a very normal situation. I and mean, pretty much everybody who DJs electronic music yeah. is also a producer. Um, but that wasn't always the case. Mm. They, were a con they were kind of a consumer and a, and a, and a, and a kind of a... Uh, a medium for, for, for entertainment, but now they're, all, now they're producers, and I think that's kind of been a very natural uh, process that's happened over the last, you know, well, I don't know when, however long, but you know, certainly the techno world. Absolutely. Um, that's, the, that's very much the case, you know, so I think that's already the beginning of that merging of uh, yeah. consumer <clears throat> and, and I And I believe we see the popularity of DJing these days the popularity of remixes, mm. the whole hip-hop and other uh, music genres that are based upon stealing other people's stuff and putting it together in new ways. Um, that is, is trends that are very obvious. And if now technology facilitates to do all of this in a much more easy, accessible fashion, I believe we will deal with music and also the music of other people in a different fashion than how we do it today, which is really sitting there and listening. I think there is going to be a lot, of more, a lot more interaction adapting again to my needs and I can decide how much I want to go or if I still do it the old yeah. old traditional way and just sit there on my sofa and listen. And speaking of, of German uh, engineering and German quality, I think it's also interesting that this change is really driven by German companies. So when you guys fire up your, your Mac and you uh, click on GarageBand, it's based on a German company which has been acquired by Apple. Um, so thank you guys very much. I think we should open it up for the short Q&A before we let everybody run out for, for lunch. So if there is any question from the, from, from the audience, please bring it up. Yeah, the phone. Um, just on the AI um, topic again, so obviously chords and, and melody, it's, it's a limited number of patterns possible. So when do you think the first number one hit will be written by an artificial intelligence completely? So once uh, that, in five it, years and ten years. Intelligent in the first place? Did I get it right? The last sentence, if you. So when, when, when's the year you think from now that really a number one hit will be written completely by uh, artificial intelligence? No, we are. If 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 a number one, number one hit can can be oh. uh, created just by AI, no. Uh, we're we're f <laughs> quite far away from that. Um, uh, from our point of view. Will that number one hit have been supported um, by AI in a, in a substantial way? Yes. Um, we, however, see other areas of music, which is not the number one, but it's basically the elevator music. Um, that is already created by artificial intelligence um, that where no human has, is, has any interaction and they just define some parameters in the beginning and then it flows and flows and flows. But 
it will never create what Daniel said earlier, exceptional music. It's just yeah, it still mediocre, sounds like okay artificial. music. Yeah. It's, it it's sounds very, very artificial. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot so, of the number one music is already very formulaic. So, uh, you know, it's not so far from actually having, you know, a machine kind of do it. But I think to really put it together and master it nicely, that's still some way to go. And there's different use cases at this point which are much closer. And I think it's also what kind of how, what kind of music you moves you. Yeah. What, 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 I mean, the point of music is it moves you emotionally in some way, makes you happy, makes you sad, makes you reflective, whatever. And certainly some music could be, you know, I can imagine the number one hit oh, pop single being completely created by so artificial absolutely. intelligence. Absolutely. Let's take one last question before everybody, uh, you know, dies of hunger. So. <laughs> no, I just want to go back to this AI music thing again. Yeah. So when we talk about the music, we talk about the emotions, we talk about love, we talk about the hate, yeah. and all those, those people, human emo emotions. Do, do you think that the machine can create emotions like human beings? Yes. <laughs> it already is actually today. I mean, there are some examples of AI music that kind of touches you on an emotional level. You know, it's very simplistic kind of piano-based music, but it really has a certain... So in the soul or deep in the heart. It's right, but, but you're talking about what creates the emotion, yeah. not about the emotion itself. So AI will never have emotions, no. but it will know how to trigger emotions, yes. and it already does. It just depends on what kind of emotion and the depth of it. But, um, I, you know, if ultimately, everything is possible. Uh, but that is a bigger discussion. It is not uh, about music anymore. It's about is, repl is machines replacing us all completely. But that is a different discussion. And uh, I, ho I sh hopefully should, it never happens. And we should also not forget, um, we as humans, we love music for the music, but also for the people that are actually doing it. And, uh, you know, the AI has to become an icon <laughs> in itself uh, also to kind of live up to those expectations. Yeah. Because, you know, this is really what everybody's looking up to. Let's give AI a personality and imagine, fan of the AI. Daniel, imagine going to an AI concert. Uh, like, <laughs> Only the um, Japanese would do that. I think <laughs> they would be pioneers. <laughs> they already do. <laughs> yeah, they already do. Yeah. yeah, they do it. All right, guys. So uh, I think to wrap it up, Next time you listen to music, might be 50% coming from, from German engineers. And uh, glad that we had all of you on stage, except, exceptionally, you know, this uh, performance after DJing from 5 to 9 in the morning. And um, wish you guys all the best. Uh, enjoy your lunch. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>